Welcome to Coming Home, Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. Another interview for parents and young teens trying to strategically plan career possibilities. Dr. Sean Means has his PhD in Applied Mathematics. He is a mathematical biologist and is a research fellow at the University of Auckland. This week is about whether one can pursue a career in STEM without going to university and which areas make a formal degree necessary. If the acronym STEM is new to you, it means science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We also talk about how postmodernism has affected universities, navigating enrolment quotas if you're not from a minority group, and equipping the student to face faith challenges university commonly brings. I especially like the advice to pick and choose your battles. In the description box below are the links to the recommended authors and to Sean's talks in apologetics. Let's hear from Sean. Thank you, Sean, for joining uh, me today to talk mm. about university. Could you start, please, by telling us a little bit about yourself? Mm. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Christine, for, for having me along. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Sean, Sean Means. I have a PhD in applied mathematics. I'm originally from New Mexico, where it's dry and brown. And I moved to uh, the almost exact opposite climate in New Zealand, <laughs> where it's it's like sea level and it rains all the time. <laughs> so that that was a bit of a shock that water falls from the sky. But I I I am moved to do my PhD. Uh, there's a big shot in my field in mathematical biology at University of Auckland. Um, James Sneed, who wrote wrote one of my textbooks, <laughs> he's co-author with math, of mathematical physiology, and so that's what brought me here was to study. I did my PhD and I could I could have left. I had opportunities to leave, but I I, I felt um, led to stay here, <laughs> you know, because why well, I'm Christian. So so I I try to detect supernatural guidance and and see where I where I'm needed and where I wanted to serve. And there's been opportunities, of course, to serve in in churches and so forth here. But also, uh, there's been work for me. There's been plenty of opportunities for me to do research. So I'm I'm currently a research fellow at at the University of Auckland and the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. And I've, I've done quite a bit of stuff on cell modeling, particularly calcium signaling. So it's like right now, the, the sound of my voice is triggering calcium sensors in your ears. <laughs> and that's firing neurons, that's triggering more calcium influxes and, and all these electrical signals. And so calcium is a big deal when it comes to cellular signaling. So that's one of the things that I'm studying um, and these days, it's in particular, it's it's the uterus. I'm I'm studying the organ that's critical to the propagation of the human race, <laughs> right? And is it is remarkably poorly understood. We we have quite a bit that we're trying to figure out, but I I get to participate in that research, and and they haven't kicked me out of the country yet. So so far, so good. <laughs> well, perhaps we could um, start talking about how you are finding the conditions of the universities at the moment, because we do get that feeling that things have changed. We're aware of the um, politics coming in, but from your observations, what have you seen change over recent years? Oh, I guess, you know, if I think back also to, uh, you know, I did my undergraduate degree at University of New Mexico in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is quite a progressive state politically, um, you know, becoming a Christian and going to university meant that I was in conflict almost immediately. <laughs> um, but I've seen that become intensified over the last few decades, you know, and I've had some, I've done some tours through, I worked at the big national lab in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at Sandia National Labs, which is one of the huge Department of Energy facilities, some 10,000 researchers there and stuff. And so I saw a variety of atmospheres there, but I've seen the slow, steady progress of increasing at least discomfort. And in some quarters, um, I, I'm loath to say hostility, but uh, at the least just irritation with the fact that a Christian is like doing doing research. I mean, I, I, I was at a conference in America recently, uh, my Society for Mathematical Biology, and 
And I, you know, I can't help it. I'm a Christian. I, you know, I have Christian friends. I go to church. I do all these churchy things. And sometimes all I have to do is just say church, and I can see researchers around me get triggered. Like they, I can see them struggling with the fact that you know I went to church. <laughs> you know, it's like, and so of course that brings out the, the little evil child in me. I can, oh, I can poke your button. <laughs> church. I just say church, and you and you freak out. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'd, I'd say that that's. That's increased in intensity since I first became a Christian in uh, 1995 when I was doing my undergraduate in UNM. But also where you see it going from from here, can can you see danger areas? What do you what is a natural outcome and what or what can we do to to halt any deterioration? Any comments around that? Oh well, there's a lot to that. <laughs> yeah. Um well, I guess for one, I I think I should I should clarify there's there's a distinction between like politicization and saying, oh, the American president is a buffoon <laughs> or or all oh, these policies are nonsense. Uh, you know, like I, I heard a lot about when Trump did ban Iranians from going to America. And there's a large contingent of Iranians at Auckland Bioengineering, and it, it really caused problems for them. So they, they couldn't really function. They couldn't go to some of the conferences. And so there's there's certain dimensions of politics where it's just like it's some politician doing these political things. Okay, that's that's one dimension. But another dimension I would say is when you have when you have ideological views that are intrinsically political that start to uh, permeate, and in fact are presumed that um, is the only rational view. And so what what I've seen, and I'm certainly not the only one, there's there's various uh, like heterodox academy and so forth that I've heard about that have pointed out there's this incredible political homogenization within academia that is it's gotten so intensive that for some, there's uh, litmus tests to see whether or not you adhere to specific ideological views. And if you don't, you're not you're not going to be hired. And some of the hiring processes are such that you have to go through not only declare your agreement with some of these things, but you have to uh, support them and embrace them and actually be advocates for and how are you going to propagate specific views. And so, you know, so some of these views are are debatable, <laughs> you know, I would say, especially as a researcher who is trained to be critical of claims, you know, the, the common question is, where's the data? You know, show me the data, convince me with data, with empirical evidence. And so a lot of the times what I see, it's not about empirical evidence. It's just about propagating a preferred view or preferred narrative and framing of how the world works and what's going on with it, which is intrinsically dangerous because, um, you know, the word diversity is bandied around so much, but diversity of viewpoint is, I would say, more important than superficial diversity because you want to have people with different perspectives. And that's why we have things in research called uh, cross-pollination, where you have, it's easy for a researcher, you get so siloed, you know, you can get so deep and, and so fragmented into an individual field. I mean, there's usually enough to keep you busy there. But often what happens is you run into problems. You're like, how do I deal with this issue? Is you have to back up and then look at how have other people dealt with these problems. And sometimes you need to cross-pollinate. You need to go to different fields and talk to different people in different arenas and see, how have you solved this problem? How did you wrangle with this? And this applies just as well to some of these political and ideological views. I mean, there are real issues in the world that need to be wrestled with, like injustices. Um, but if we, if we just adhere to one view and one solution, I think that's uh, problematic in and of its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no, <laughs> okay. That's yeah. good, Shauna. Thank uh, you. Um, so if the staff who are being onboarded into the universities have to be seen to be towing a line, if you like, does that not threaten the nature of, of research and debate and tussling about of ideas that might be um, outside of a of a um, of a system, H how does that actually do good for humanity to restrict like that? Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> um, I've I've been seeing some 
you know, heavyweight researchers. I'm I'm nobody special. I'm a rank and file uh, postdoc, <laughs> uh, you know, and and I'm actually very fortunate that I'm still doing research, and I'm not sure why. It seems like this is what the Lord wants me to do. Um, I prefer teaching, actually, but I've been doing research gigs for a while, and it just seems seems to keep on going. But there are big names in research, um, some of whom I do not like, and I don't agree with a lot of what they say, like Jerry Coyne, the the rather virulent evolutionist <laughs> who has his blog, Why Evolution is True. But he's teamed up with, I think she's a Brazilian researcher, that are pointing out that these restrictions on what is acceptable, say, what are acceptable questions, what are acceptable uh, solutions, what are acceptable conversations to have uh, when it comes to researching things, uh, has the potential, and and they argue it already is happening, that it's damaging biological research, because it, you know, it's not going to work. <laughs> How, how can you say it? It's like, well, we can only look at things from this perspective um, and, and we are only allowed to investigate things that lead in a certain direction. Uh, when you're doing research, sometimes you have no idea where you're going to go. You, 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 go, you go hacking through the forest, you get on top of a hill and you're like, yay, I made it. I figured out this problem. And then you look around. Oh, no, I need to be over there. <laughs> right? So, sometimes you don't know until you dig into it. And if issues that have uh, like an ideological preference or preferred outcome that's dangerous because it's well you don't have any guarantee that the preferred outcome is going to match with what the data is telling you or with what the research where it leads because you don't know sometimes you have no idea mm -hmm. that's what folks like jerry coin has been pointing out i um i do have links to some of these articles that i, I can share with you if, if you want to share those as well mm -hmm. That would be that would be handy. I will get those off you, and I'll pop them in the description box for interested viewers to to follow up there. Because it it, it just I just cannot get my head around why they would want to people like you've mentioned want to increase an ideology at the expense of genuine development within whatever science is the, is their mm -hmm. discipline. It just I just don't see how that's useful for humanity, and and wonder where's the line in the sand is there anybody going to start <laughs> trying to you know turn the ship to go the other way it's... yeah well i think it's because um many of the folks that are pushing this they believe they're doing right mm. you know they're, they're convinced that they're trying to fix uh wrongs in society and and you know there's no shortage of wrongs in society <laughs> right so you know i agree that there are issues there are things that need to be dealt with um you know i think some of the social justice issues that they're wrangling with are real and should be should be tackled but by the same token it's uh, when one starts approaching them and demanding there's only one explanation and there's only one solution that that often causes more problems than it solves and and that's what i fear is that some of these efforts are causing more problems than they're solving and along the way there is there's all this damage that's happening and and you know i've, I've looked at some of these things trying to understand what's the undercurrent what's what's the foundations for some of these things and honestly is it's a lot of the postmodernism. um ideas of postmodernists like uh, foucault and um Derrida and so forth, but there's a, a, a relatively obscure one, uh, Rorty, an American fellow, that I per particularly take issue with because <laughs> he took shots at my my field, at science in particular, and saying that uh, mathematical research, you know, isn't really doesn't really have any value. Um, you know, I'm paraphrasing very broadly because I can't quite remember precisely what he said, but he was basically criticizing the idea of of objectively interpreting facts there's always going to be some subjectivity but however uh, no matter how you interpret some scenario their scenario still has an objective reality to it um, and one of the analogies i heard is like a map you know so you can have many different people make maps of a territory and each one of them may have validity to them because they have a subjective view of the map but at the end of the day if you want to use one of these maps and get from point A to point B, it needs to be it needs to relate to the objective territory. <laughs> it needs it needs to be useful. It needs to be anchored in the objective reality of what is the terrain. How do I get from point A to point B? And mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so some of these philosophical trends that started oh, in the fifties, the sixties, and Rorty was in the seventies, and they've kind of fused with other ideas 
um, about say social issues and oppression and and oppressive dynamics in in society and and have emerged into a lot of the trends that we see today. And they capture people into thinking we have to fix this and this is the way to do it. Um, but then refusing to acknowledge uh, that there are other views and there are other possibilities and other solutions. That's that's a problem. Is it appropriate in this interview, Sean, to to give an example of that? of what is relevant at the moment oh you mean like like issues in society or mm. <laughs> oh i would say one of the one of the most pressing issues that we have is just poverty um you know i i've i've been very fortunate <laughs> you know i've i've almost always had a job almost i always had income and i did wonder what happened years ago when my funding ran out here and I did have a job opportunity back in New Mexico at one of the labs that they wanted me to go up there. And I, I didn't want to go back to New Mexico. I was like, no, I want to stay here. <laughs> and so I, it was facilitated uh, by circumstance. You know, I had a benefactor that I lived with that I was able to live very inexpensively. And so um, I had to live on a shoestring budget. So I just had a taste <laughs> of what it's like to be impoverished. And it's crippling. And I've wondered, you know, how many... How many brilliant mathematicians, how many gifted artists, how, how many incredible uh, uh, incredible writers, incredible thinkers are too busy trying to feed themselves, <laughs> right? They're too busy trying to, to struggle and pay the rent or, or just find a, a secure environment, you know, uh, you know, because struggles can also extend beyond the poverty and uh, impact on family units. Like if you have a dysfunctioning family or an abusive family, it's very difficult for a child to flourish. And so I would say that's that's one of the most pressing concerns is, you know, what can we do about impoverished uh, families and children that suffer in these things? And so I, I would say that that's a, that's a real problem. And there's also a lot of data that, that goes with it, you know, okay, Sean, where's the data? Yeah, I, I have data. There was an amazing uh, research program at Stanford that tracked American families for like 30 years. And they show that there's a profound correlation between broken families, broken black families that don't have a black father figure and poverty. So if you if you destroy or dismantle or disrupt family units, particularly amongst blacks, the correlation wasn't quite as strong amongst white families. But so it, there's this incredible poverty that attaches itself to a, particularly like single unwed mothers that are struggling to provide for their kids. And of course, you, 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 the state can do some things and try to dump money on them and so forth. But there's also something to be said, and I can feel the same way, you know, when you have a job and you're being paid to do something, it's very validating, <laughs> right? But it's also being a productive member of society means that you're using your gifts and talents. And we all have gifts and talents, and we should be using them. And, uh, you know, and that's something that I think could transform society if there was a genuine effort to deal with poverty. Yeah. How have you seen the, the issue of, of your example of poverty affect what happens in the universities and mm -hmm. also closely related to it, the ideology which we've already touched on? How mm -hmm. does that affect uh, students who might be coming in who, who would be in that um, in that situation? Oh. oh, well, of course, well, I guess my answer would be have two mm -hmm. elements to it. It's one thing is... You know, of course, if you want to stop property and and resolve property and uh, pro property <laughs> poverty and and release them from it, um, well, what's the solution? And what's well, I guess what's the cause? What's the solution? And once again, I see ideologically, there's one cause and there's one solution. <laughs> and it's funny to see like the one cause of it has to be uh, discrimination, it has to be some sort of prejudicial, uh, um, intrinsic thing in society. And the only way to fix it is to burn society down. And, and I feel like they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. Um, but by the same token, I also think universities, uh, in some ways, they try to do good. You know, there are scholarships available. And when I, when I was at University of New Mexico, they, they started this thing called the lottery scholarship. So they started a state lottery where you could buy, buy a, a $1 ticket and hope you get lots of money, <laughs> right? And they don't, I noticed they don't print the odds of success on the ticket. <laughs> so you don't know, but so a lot of that money, a lot of that income uh, was justified in saying, well, we're going to fund scholarships. So they would pay any New Mexican resident could go to university for the first year for free, um, which, which provided opportunities. But by the same token, 
I had students come in that they didn't have a clue. They were not ready at all. And they came in and, you know, the, the material just, just brutalized them. They were not ready. And, but then by the same token, it's, you know, some of the students, they weren't ready, but they, they fought it. They, they went at it and they struggled and they grappled with the material. They came to me and I worked with them. But then I had some students, they didn't make any effort at all. And all they did is get angry. <laughs> you know, they came and they begged and pleaded, can you please pass me? No, it's not fair. These people have been killing themselves, you know, and they're passing. Should I just, should I just give you a pass? You, ha you know, I, I, some of these people, I didn't even know. I didn't meet them like all semester. And they come in the last day begging and pleading. It's like, I don't even know who you are. You know, if you had made an effort, I'd try to work with you. But, you know. So I think it's it's a combination, and and I think universities and some state programs have tried to provide opportunities, but also by the same token, it takes more than than the opportunity. Sometimes it takes uh, the motivation. Mm -hmm. We had that uh, situation in New Zealand too recently, where the um, the government were giving the first year free to mm -hmm. the universities, which at first pass sounds like well that's a good idea, but mm -hmm. as it was implemented the opinion that started to circulate was, well, wouldn't it have been better to give their last year free so that you had them in committed for the and working hard oh. for the first mm. two or three years then to get that last one because the dropout rate was so oh. high? Yeah. I think I remember this. This was just a few years ago, wasn't it? Because yes. um, I think I remember the university, I think they were basically ordered by the government, you're going to do this. But I don't think the government really gave them the money to do it because there was all this budgeting issues that started falling down on all of us. I remember my colleague was saying, was fretting. He was like, oh, gosh, we have to restructure our whole budget because there's a bunch of money that's just gone. The university is funding all these students. Um, so, I, you know, sometimes, yeah, <laughs> it's good to give opportunities. But I sometimes wonder if if these, you know, government instituted programs are nothing but just uh, just ticking boxes for political reasons. <laughs> you know, it looks good, <laughs> right? But I guess I I don't know what the end outcome was. You know, what what happened? Like how many, like you say, how many students that were on those first years actually kept going and got to that final year? And I bet it'd be interesting to see what happened with the New Mexico State Lottery because I, I lost touch with them. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's just move on a little bit to what do you then suggest to students who are wanting to enroll uh, in the universities now where preferential enrollment is being given to uh, minorities? So specifically in New Zealand, we've got Maori and Pacifica um, roles or quotas, if you like. And it just seems that there are a lot of white students, especially white men and, and now um, Asian students who, who don't get positions in universities when they are more than capable because their places have been earmarked mm. for um, other minorities. So it's not really my intention to discuss that as an ideology, although we could if you wanted to, especially if you had some um, direct observations in it. But it's more that, well, what, what do you do if you don't fit into one of those minorities? But now um, the chances of you even getting in are slimmer. What suggestions do you have? Is there any way to navigate that kind of scenario to apply to get into a course? Gosh, because, uh, you know, when I was thinking about this, um, you know, I, I, I've i monitored the American situation, you know, a bit more close, of course, because I'm American. <laughs> um, and seeing how it's playing out in New Zealand, I, I'm not quite sure how one might deal with it. You know, I guess just to say in America, I've seen uh, legal responses. Um, so like, say, for employment. Um, so say if uh, an academic is turned down for a job and they can get some sort of evidence that it was, they were turned down because of their, because of their ethnicity, that's, that's a violation, <laughs> right? That's illegal. You can't do that. And the recent Supreme court ruling, uh, a ruling that came out against affirmative action, it was amazing. Um, the response, uh, that I saw at universities basically fretting on how they can continue to have preferential treatment for certain ethnicities, <laughs> despite the fact that the Supreme Court just said, you can't do that. <laughs> um, 
so that there was a legal recourse in America. Here in New Zealand, I'm not sure. And then also for students, you're kind of, you're, you're, it sounds very Kafka-esque, doesn't it? <laughs> you're standing before this, this machine, this, this monolithic bureaucracy that's basically, uh, <laughs> that's pre-assigning you of certain value uh, based on a quality you have no control over, which is unfair. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I wonder if if the way to deal with these, like if you got rejected and you suspect it was because of your ethnicity, you know, maybe there's a legal recourse to New Zealand, but also maybe you just don't want to go to that university. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I've seen this more. I haven't, I haven't had to deal with with students wrangling with that stuff, and I haven't personally known anyone. And you know, the students that I run into, you know, they're they're well past the the entry phase, so I can't really speak to that. But you know, I'm just wondering if I was in that circumstance and I applied to a university and I got rejected, even if I was a sterling student, which incidentally I was not. <laughs> I was I had a terrible GPA as an undergrad. I have. A very colorful, <laughs> colorful experience in undergraduate, but um, but so it might be an indicator. Go somewhere else, uh, um, you know, try a different place or try something else. And so it's like like what we were saying about um, some of the stuff about is it necessary to go to university? Uh, there's there's and and it isn't just like if you want to do an academic thing or if you want to study an academic field, university is a natural place, but. By the same token, there's so much content and material you can get without going to the university. You know, so do you necessarily need to conform to these to these desired inputs and these these weightings that the university places on people? Um, so that's that's kind of my thought <laughs> without really providing a real solution. You know, like I I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. You know, as, and and I guess also as a researcher, I've I've heard about how the government has weighted. You know, the Royal Society has weighted Maori and Pacifica researchers and giving them more value. And I, I immediately asked the professor that announced this at, at bioengineering, I was like, isn't this going to be open for abuse? And I'm not, I'm not thinking about Maori and Pacifica, I'm thinking about the university. <laughs> that it's like, oh, you're worth more. <laughs> you know, how hard is it to find some token Maori researcher and just march them along and give them whatever credentials they need. I mean, it's just, this is coming from a cynical academic <laughs> that's dealt with universities and seeing how they are when it comes to money, <laughs> right? They're, they're pretty, they're pretty intense at times. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I guess, I guess one of, one of the, the very real solutions I think is just don't go to university. <laughs> yeah. What degrees do you think, uh, before we tease that idea out, and I would really like to do that. What mm. degrees do you think mm. you absolutely have to go to university? You cannot get a career pathway without it. Mm. But I think it's tied up with like the infrastructure. You know, as I was saying about this, there are there are examples of, you know, absolutely brilliant mathematicians that had no formal training whatsoever. It was difficult for them to be recognized. You know, the, the first example always comes to mind is Ramanujan, the, the Indian fellow, that he was doing beautiful mathematics and he was sending them to mathematicians. And I, I believe no one responded until some fellow at Oxford. He was like, good grief, what is this? This is amazing, right? Now, he didn't really have formal training. He just, he just loved mathematics and he was very good at it. But so there's not a lot of infrastructure needed for mathematics, right? A whiteboard, you know, it's maybe a computer. Uh, caffeine, <laughs> you, know, you, you know, or tequila, you know, depending on the case, right? Um, but for other things, you need infrastructure, <laughs> right? So it's like I would say for wet lab stuff, if you want to learn how to how to do experimental work or or anything like that, it's 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 much harder, I would say, to do it without the support of a system like a university or some something, you know. But I I really don't know offhand where you could go for some of that stuff, but there's def definitely, um, you know, some of the fields are more amenable to, to sidestepping the, the university machine. <laughs> and within the STEM subjects, do you mean, or are you thinking humanities? Oh, I was thinking STEM actually myself, like the theoretical stuff, you know, like, like for me, um, 
you know, you know, this is my little virtual office at home. And so during the lockdowns, I was able to function. I could, I was still working. I was still, I was still supervising students. I was still having meetings because I mean, I was able to just sit here and work and work on my, you know, do my theoretical stuff. I don't need to go in and cut rats and stuff. Whereas my office mate, she couldn't do anything. She was locked out, uh, um, essentially out of a lot of her lab work and months went by and it was, it was really crippling for the research on our project. She, she really struggled to get anything done, you know, but so it's by nature of, you know, it's just the theoretical stuff. You don't really need to have that much infrastructure. So I think, I think that's a critical component to it, but you know, at, at the end of the day though, it's, it's also, what are you interested in? <laughs> Um, like if you're going to go into STEM, if you want to do research, you better be interested in it because you're going to suffer. <laughs> um, there are many times where it's like, I don't want to deal with this problem, you know, but I have to get through this little issue so I can get, you know, some forward progress and figure out stuff. And that's, yeah, I do not recommend going into research just for a job because you're going to suffer for that paycheck. <laughs> yeah. So you have to really, really want to do the research. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because I, I mean, I enjoy research, you know. And I, but I also enjoy teaching, and I, I wish I had more of that. <laughs> oh. So, so do you think then within the STEM subjects, um, most of them would need you'd you'd need to do a degree. You'd have to formally enter university. You can't really do an alternative parallel type learning experience at mm. the moment. Can you see coming up? Perhaps I realize it's a completely rhetorical question. So. Um, at the moment, the the bureaucracy, as you say, is set up. There's not much negotiation in that. But can you see that maybe within the future that that if you had a, a well qualified academic who was willing to mentor somebody who was not going to formally enrol, could they actually start to take a pathway, let's say, in mathematics? Hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah, because even if you're in the university and you don't have a mentor, it's much harder. Um, it isn't until you connect with people and, you know, it's it's a lot of who you know, <laughs> right? And that was partly why I came and I studied with with my advisor because uh, a lot of science is, who's your daddy, <laughs> right? Who, who, who did you work with? Who was your supervisor? And, and, and so my supervisor, he's very well known and, and, not that it's necessarily open doors for me, but it actually just establishes, oh, you study with so-and-so, you should know what you're doing, <laughs> that kind of thing. But so without that mentorship, without that guidance, without that supervision, it, it's much harder. And I mean, you can skate by for a while without having that, but if you can land that outside of the university, that's great. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot about who you're working with and the network of people that you know, um, the credentials are often just expected. You know, so you got a PhD after your name. Okay, sweet. But who did you work with? <laughs> yeah. So I, so I would highly recommend if you can, if you can, if you can connect with a mentor and sidestep a lot of this bureaucratic machinery, that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> mm, mm, all right. The reason why I'm, I'm talking about that specifically with, with those questions is uh, I'm just beginning a new series for homeschooling families to start uh, maybe in their early teens, helping to guide their students, their children, young teens towards their career. Now, to my generation, uh, most parents would, wouldn't would even stop to think, is there a better way? Is university the correct path to go? Because it meant it was the epitome of a successful well, for my case, homeschooling, you had done really well as a homeschooler. Wow, five of your kids into university and you homeschooled, you know, wow, mm, well yeah, done yeah. you. But <laughs> yeah. things things have changed and and I'm trying to help students and their parents get a picture that it isn't necessarily the only way to go these days. And you, in our pre-recording chat, you were talking about uh, some of the uh, propaganda that, that kids are coming under at at universities hmm. um rather than just getting on and learning what they're there to learn yeah so that's part of my motivation today sean and in, in, in speaking to you is trying to help parents to see that there could be another pathway 
than the given of university. So maybe not in the STEMs, hey? I mean, it depends. For some of the fields, it can be quite challenging. <laughs> yeah, because, and I think the infrastructure problem is really hard to overcome. You know, because also some of these wet lab research projects, they're expensive. Uh, the the price they have to pay for equipment and then also just getting getting uh, experimental subjects like you know there's a whole factory generating laboratory rats to be experimented on there, that's a huge piece of infrastructure that you're probably not going to find just lying around <laughs> yeah yeah so, so it depends on what you're interested in but but i also wouldn't just throw in the towel necessarily i mean if if you get into a university you're not alone as like as a Christian or as a homeschooled student, you know, there are others like you. <laughs> um, you know, as I was to say is when I became a Christian, I was, I was studying at the university and I, I was alone and I started making uh, observations and criticisms. And I was publishing these things in the, in the daily Lobo, the university newspaper. And I was getting attention because people were like, who are you? <laughs> and I got chased down and I started, oh, I'm not alone, you know, because it's in so many ways, I think that's how the enemy works uh, with Christians is to isolate you and make you feel like you're alone and just keep peeing on you until you conform to what they want. And so I'd say one of the critical aspects, like if you get into the university and you decide to do all this stuff, connect with other Christians. You know, there are support groups, you know, and, and in retrospect, you know, when I discovered some of these, like, oh, my gosh, I should have connected with a bunch of these so I didn't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's let's pause at that idea there because I think we're reasonably familiar that the attrition rate amongst mm -hmm. uh, the young ones when they're going to university is is reasonably high, shockingly high actually. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any advice for students uh, preparing for that challenge when they're going into universities? Is is to how to protect themselves and their faith, how to become stronger through the adversity of the challenges they're going to be under. Hmm. Well, I would definitely say that's that's a huge component of it. Is don't do it alone, <laughs> right? Connect with a community of like minded believers, um, but also you know, the Christian faith is not irrational. <laughs> I mean, that's something that I that I get struck by is, you know, being a Christian amongst uh, academics that typically don't understand or just outright mock and ridicule uh, one's faith. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's often difficult to understand for some of these individuals that Christianity is, is actually quite rational. <laughs> that being a theist is, is, is actually, um, I, I find far more defensible than being an atheist. <laughs> But you know that that's kind of a separate issue. But but by the same token, it also provides um, some armor. Um, you know, there's this thing called Christian apologetics. <laughs> you know, that I'm a little involved in, <laughs> right? But so, you know, it's uh, it's easy to tap into some resources uh, in the sense that there's a lot available. Um, you know, of course, it can be overwhelming, but there's there's a lot of resources. So. If particularly if like if you're interested in biology, you know, um, like what I did, I was confronted over the whole evolution creation thing. It was like, I don't know. I studied maths. I didn't care about biology. And then I became a Christian and all of a sudden, oh, OK, I have to figure out this biology thing. So I start taking biology I start reading books. And when I was when I was educating myself and it was I was arming myself with with like, say, for instance, Christian views on it, but then also looking at some of the the secular views. I started seeing there's huge holes in the evolutionary picture in the evolutionary paradigm. There's a lot we don't know. They don't tell you this stuff. And so then by the same token, taking on some apologetics and, and looking at what, what bigger minds than mine have to say about some of these things. And so you can arm yourself. And But by the same token, when you're navigating the university landscape, um, <laughs> You kind of have to pick and choose your battles, <laughs> right? Um, my one of my favorite mentors, and actually he's the co-author with my advisor. So there's there's an amazing evangelical Christian mathematician at the University of Utah, James Keener. Um, and I I almost studied at Utah, uh, not because of him. I had another opportunity, but it would have been great to be around him. He's one of the biggest names in mathematical biology in the world. He's he's a real big shot. But I remember asking about some of this stuff, you know, how do you navigate universities and being critical of some of these evolutionary worldviews? And and so this is what 
world famous mathematical biologist said is like you kind of keep it under your hat <laughs> and he was and he told me how he who would give a he'd give the keynote speech to some big conference on mathematical biology sit down and have lunch and some fellow would ask him blah 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 evolution and then he would criticize it and they wait a minute are you a christian are you a creationist and then, you know jim would say yeah <laughs> and then boom he'd get immediately labeled oh you're a kook <laughs> I was like, this this man is no kook. <laughs> you know, Jim Keener is he's a very well established professor, but that was his advice. You know, coming from one of these big shots, sometimes you have to just keep it under your hat and wait for opportunities and pick and choose your battles, because ultimately, and this is something I think maybe as academics or as intellectuals or doing apologetics and whatnot, you gets lost in the mix of all this. This is a supernatural thing. You're dealing with a supernatural issue. I have I have explained the gospel. It's such a simple thing <laughs> to people and just laid it out. It's very obvious. You know, have you ever lied? Well, you're a sinner. You, know, you need you need forgiveness. Here you go. And I've seen people, oh wow, this is great. And then literally watch a veil of malice and hatred just fall over their face. Like a response from something intervening at that moment. This is a supernatural thing. If you're going to go into a university and study, you know, not only do you have to equip your mind, you have to be supernaturally stable <laughs> and and anchored. And so that's partly why I say get into a community of believers. But it's not just that. Pray, read your Bible, see what God wants you to do, how God leads you. Because God can do amazing things. Who knew? <laughs> right? I've I've been in circumstances where God has used me at universities to touch people's lives or just to be there in the right place at the right time. When someone, I mean, I've had I've had uh, mathematics mathematicians come to me and ask me, "How do I become a Jesus? <laughs> you know, tell me more about Jesus." Just out of the blue, it wasn't anything I did. <laughs> I'm just sitting there like a doofus trying to figure out my math problem, and this person comes in, "Tell me how to be a Christian." Oh, <laughs> sometimes God just puts us in the right place at the right time, and you know, I. And part of me is is rather keen to get out of academia because sometimes I get tired of the friction of it all. But, you know, God has his own purposes, you know, and I get the impression he wants me there because there might be another person that's going to pop in my office when I'm banging my head on a keyboard. How do I become a Christian? Oh, <laughs> OK. Right. So, so I would say underneath all of it, it's supernatural. It's a supernatural thing. Get anchored supernaturally and go from there. Can you give me the name of that professor from, from Utah again? I think he would be. Oh, yeah. yeah let's see. Um, Jim Keener. Jim Keener. This, James Keener. Okay, that's 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 good. Yeah, yeah. A any other uh, big shot names you can think of that have got leverage, instant leverage, if you like, um, mm. that, that young Christian scientists or mathematicians can go to and be strengthened by their own arguments and examples to, you know, to undergird right. themselves, if you like. Right. Oh, it's it's hard to beat Jim. Okay. <laughs> he's he's, he's, he's uh, quite a quite a fellow. Um, very very rare individual. But there are there are um, there were Christians in the math department at University of Auckland. And I don't, I don't know how that's panned out. There was uh, John Butcher was a lovely, lovely professor, world famous uh, dynamics uh, ODE professor. I heard about him before I even moved to New Zealand, and then it's like, oh wow, John Butcher's here, <laughs> right? So they had, they had some big names here, um, but I can't really, off the top of my head, I can't think beyond Jim. I know there was a fellow in chemistry, and then of course there was also George Seaver who was in stats. Um, but for some of it, it's like you just have to you have to look around. <laughs> I mean, and I have to say too, I I, I was fortunate how I met Jim, because he is at at University of Utah, which is in Salt Lake City, which is Mormon Central. And when my friend was trying to convince me to do my PhD there, she was telling me how oh Jim Keener does Bible studies and blah blah blah, and I was like, well, what kind? <laughs> it was just, I'm not Mormon. <laughs> it's very different Christianity. And it wasn't until I went up there and I and I met him and I just asked him about the Bible studies. And he was like, oh, I'm evangelical. So sometimes you just have to ask around and look around um, because it's like to have that personal connection. I was very fortunate uh, to personally connect with Jim. And then over the years at conferences, 
here's big shot Jim. And there are all these, all these big shot are people, directors and professors are trying to talk to him. They're like, no, 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 I'm going to talk to Sean. We're going to go pray. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so I'm sure that God would have, God will bring you together with someone. Sometimes you have to look around and knock on doors and see, see how it goes. Mm. All right, then, um, Sean, thinking then about uh, homeschoolers who have decided that they want a career in maths and the sciences, <clears throat> and they're still at home and they're homeschooling, but they've still got a few years ahead of them to prepare for this. What do you see is imperative and then what is helpful to beginning with years even before they're supposed to be going to university? Because as I mentioned before, homeschoolers are in a unique position. They can curate a curriculum for their family according to what their natural giftings and interests are. So they can they could be one step ahead of, of, of let's say, a state school system because they have that opportunity. And they can yeah. do this without compromising on any of the basics. So help these families to fast track and help them make these decisions as to what should they be including in their curriculum. Oh, boy. So that's, I guess that's something I had never really appreciated is how uh, – uh, homeschooling can dynamically adapt. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, right. So you get so you would have the fundamentals, but you can you can vary some of the specifics. Um, of course, I'm quite biased because you know my my background is math. So you know, think about it from a mathematical perspective. Um, if you're willing to go through the rigmarole of it all. <laughs> uh, Sometimes it's best to tap into what are the currents, uh, what's currently going on in some field. Um, part of that, of course, is tied up with well, what are you interested in? So if you're interested in biology, well, what kind of biology? Um, biology is vast, <laughs> right? There's so many different layers of biology. Uh, so, or, or are you interested in physics? Oh, okay. Well, what kind of physics or chemistry or engineering, there's all kinds of different kinds of engineering as well. And then even within mathematics, you know, although I do have to remind people, statistics is not mathematics. <laughs> it's, it's a very different piece, right? But so I would say that if, if you do want to connect with people at a university, particularly like, um, like connect with a mentor, and if you want to connect with a mentor outside of university, maybe they're, at, they're an academic that's in university and you want to connect with them, a real way to do that is through what are they studying? <laughs> what are they working on? Right. So if you find a particular field that you're really interested in, you know, dig into it. <laughs> Who's doing that and where are they doing it? And I guess that was one of the things when I was at New Mexico, there was nobody doing math biology really. When I when I did my master's and my master's degree, my thesis was unfortunately for those who were tortured into reading it, was held up as the example. And I felt bad for them because it was terrible. It's, when I go back and look, this is awful. <laughs> they force you to read this. But so some of the professors tell me, you need to go somewhere else. You have to go somewhere else because there's not really a lot of math bio here at UNM. And that's another reason why I came here to, to Auckland. And there's there's a thriving mathematical biology uh, community here. But so that, that that's part of it. Is So if you find something that you're interested in, you know, of course, there's the big fields drill down into something a little more specific, but find the people that are doing it. Look to see what what are they doing? You know, what are they researching? Do Some of it, of course, can get quite technical. Them? What's that? Sorry, Sean. Do you mean actually approaching people at the universities and asking maybe to have an appointment with them? How are you going to find out? Oh, that's that's the thing is, if you want to find what people are researching, sometimes you just have to go to department websites and just look around at the individuals. That's one way. Another way is to go through uh, scientific databases. For me, I use PubMed heavily in my in my personal research. And if you just go to PubMed and just just search for something like calcium signaling neurons, and you get tons of papers, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, and of course, it I bet that's a bit overwhelming, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, what are you interested in? <laughs> you know, this is all the stuff in the universe you could be studying. <laughs> so your head explodes. So. But if you got time to sort it, you know, because that's one thing is kind of see, well, this is kind of what's happening in this field or that's what's happening in that field. And there are there are ways to kind of get an idea of what's going on. But I would say if particularly if you wanted to connect with a mentor, 
well, find someone that's working on something you're interested in. Yeah, that, that's a that's a real way, because particularly if a researcher is is dug, tucked deep into something and, and a student comes along and they have a question, well, how does this work? <laughs> you know, or what does this do? You may not get a response because some professors, you know, they may not be interested, but then there might be one that does respond and says, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, I appreciate your interest. And they may actually respond because um, students are essential <laughs> for research. Uh, I guess that's one thing that I kind of miss about lecturing is when I would lecture, I I could get students interested in working on projects, you know, because I, I can I can put up cartoons and play lots of music and dance. <laughs> If we're doing research on organ X, you know, come and work with us. And I've gotten students interested over the years and stuff. But, um, you know, academics constantly need exposure to students, constantly need to interact with students because students, particularly PhD students, are the grunts of science. If it wasn't for PhD, there would be no science. <laughs> it wouldn't be getting done. Because uh, generally what happens is academics chase money and the students actually do the work. <laughs> That's usually how it works. Right. But so if a student comes along and, and, and expresses an interest, especially an educated interest, um, so they have looked into it and kind of understand what's going on in some field. But I can understand that, that good grief, uh, some of it can be overwhelmingly technical. <laughs> yeah. So that that may turn into a more of a challenge than people might be <laughs> might be equipped to deal with. So so I guess it depends. It depends. Mm -hmm. But at least it gives some parents and students an idea of what they could actually do, that they mm. get a sense of direction for their child. Um, so, for example, one of our boys uh, in his early teens, uh, engineering was where he wanted to go mm. in, into um, mechatronics. So we made an appointment to go up and see the head of department up at Massey in the Albany village. And for our son to, to go in there and have... Well, well, first of all, we were blown away that he actually said yes, and he gave up his time to see oh, the parents and this young kid who may or may not ever come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he showed us around some of what was was going on there, you know, cars they were researching on and, and mm. lab stuff, and it just opened up our son's eyes, and all of a sudden he could mm. see the possibility of what he could be working towards instead of just some vague notion, oh, I'm going to go and study robotics. Yeah. And that just lit a fire in his belly, which gave him the motivation. Now he knew why he wanted to finish off mm. school so that he could get into and get yeah. up to this exciting course. And mm. then this was like a couple of years later, he, he qualifies, does everything and goes in. Oh, and the professor actually gave him some advice as this is what you, you need to be studying. This is right. what you need to do. Yeah. And then he goes into it and he's remembered. He actually remembered us going into his office because he said not many people do that. So um, I know from experience. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, worth exactly. The exactly. Worth the doing. And that very early networking, I suppose you could call it, actually had good mm. weight for him you know, through, through uni. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Having a, it's when there's a personal element to it because your researchers are people too. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. And when a, when a student and a family expresses interest in what, what a researcher is doing, <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm just, I'm just trying to think, well, what if someone, what if I got an email? So what is all this crazy stuff you're doing on the uterus? Oh, <laughs> it's, well, well, uh, this is this, and it's, you actually want to talk about it. Oh my gosh, I'm getting attention. <laughs> yeah, for me that would have been great. Yeah, no, yeah, fully, fully. That's that's awesome that that you had that experience, and but then also, like you say, it it put, it gave it a reality, it crystallized it into something. Oh, this is something real, and then and then actually a pathway there. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Closely related to that kind of 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 thinking. And, and you've touched on the research that you're doing now, which is, uh, I think you said it was relatively new and unknown until recently. Oh, is that well, right? there's, there's not a lot of uh, basic research on uterine function. Like, what are the triggers for uh, parturition, for labor? Nobody knows. It, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> 
and the uterus goes through a tremendous restructuring. So it changes dramatically, duh, <laughs> right? It's, all of a sudden it's got a passenger, <laughs> right? And then at some magical, mysterious moment, it's like, okay, time to get out, <laughs> right? And it goes through a lot of restructuring to do its job, you know? And and it hasn't been studied very well. There's, um, I guess, just a visual. So my my professor, my boss, at ABI, she just shows this plot that sh that says over the last 20 years, there's a, this many papers on cardiac. There's been this many papers on gastrointestinal. There's been this many papers on uterine. <laughs> it's just, there's just not a lot of money and interest, you know, pouring into the field. So. Mm. Looking in a broader sense of your particular area in the maths um, biology, can you identify or have you thought about what, what are the needs of humanity, let's say within the maths and the science realm, that are just waiting to be researched or or um, pursued? What, what are the big gaps that we actually need that um, some of us, let's say homeschool students who might have an interest in that can now hone their sight onto, oh, I'm interested in that. Maybe I could go in towards that idea. Can you think of any any research areas that are just gaping holes of need? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm so, oh, uh, so I guess I've been too I've been too deep in my little research hole here, <laughs> just doing my thing. Oh wow! Um, that's that's a that's a tough one. I, I'd say because you know to say that there's gaping holes. Um, it actually makes me think think more of some of the talks I've given about politics and evolution and politics and science. And what does happen in research is you get research guided in certain directions. You know, there's people that make decisions whether or not you get a grant. And 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 of course this is gonna sound really cynical, but the science is the noble pursuit of funding, <laughs> right? And it's because without money, you, you can't really do anything. I mean, you, you have to, you know, find a way to pay the bills. And I went through that for a couple of years as a, as an unemployed researcher. And it, it gets it gets to be quite a struggle. But the way science is directed, you know, there are people making decisions. Oh, I like this grant or I like this proposal. Give them money. You know, so where the money goes and how it's funneled. And so I'd say there's, there's definitely gaps in the sense that... Um, you know, some of the interests that are out there are don't really support um, viewpoints that are challenging to overarching narratives, <laughs> uh, particularly when it comes to like an evolutionary paradigm or or like more recently when it comes to some of these ideological paradigms that, you know, it's 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 only suitable to look at the ills in society as a result of X. <laughs> and the only way to solve it is Y. Um you know, so I, I'm seeing the same thing. A lot of money is just being poured into that specific direction. But for just um, like if you could step out of some of these political frameworks and see what well, there's, oh, wow, there's a huge area that's ripe for research. Got me. <laughs> um, you know, I've had plenty of ideas, you know, in, in doing my research that went nowhere or or they were really hard and I just didn't have time to follow them up, you know, because I've, I've got a few, but Sometimes what you have to do is you have to dip your toes into into different fields and see what's going on. Um, like I didn't, you know, I didn't really know anything about the the uterine function and labor and all that stuff until they headhunted me uh, when the country was locked down because they landed a massive grant and they were desperate for researchers and, and they needed anyone within the country pretty much. And so they hunted me down and got me. In. So it was money that got me into this project. And I've and I found the the physiology and the and the cell biology fascinating, uh, partly because I'm just a mathematical biologist. That's what I do. Um, but so sometimes, in order to see where there's a gap of knowledge, you have to look and see. Well, what do we know, <laughs> right? So what do we know about System X, or what do we know about System Y? And so I'd say, you know, if if someone is keen to try and find these gaps, well, first of all what are you generally interested in? What do you have a proficiency for? You know, like not everyone's cut out to do applied math. Some people are better at stats or some people are better at biology. Um, I, you know, I pity the fool that gives me a microscope because <laughs> I will probably destroy it, <laughs> right? Yeah, but once you figure out which arena you're interested in, then you have to kind of look and see, well, what's going on in here? 
You know, that's partly why scientists and professors and grant reviewers, you're constantly kind of tapping into what's currently going on in some field. You know, what are the most recent publications and what seems to be the struggles? And it's amazing to me as I as I got into the uterine systems and I started looking, I was like, wow, there's massive gaps. There's so much we don't know. And I guess I just presumed, you know, of course, someone looked at this because, you know, pregnancy and birth seems to be critical <laughs> in some way. Right. <laughs> but, but it hasn't. It, it, there's, there's such a paucity of information. There's so little that we know about some of these basic functions of just, you know, giving birth, you know, how, how does all this stuff work? And I had no idea until I just started looking at it and just start reading the papers on it. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a gap there. Sometimes you won't know until you just dip your toe in the water and you're just like, oh, oh, people don't really know this stuff. And I, I guess by the same token, when, you know, I was confronted with the whole evolution creation thing, you know, when I started reading biology stuff on my own, not just taking the freshman lectures and the textbooks, but then started reading, uh, reading research articles and stuff and saying, it was like, oh my gosh, there's, there's huge question marks. There's so much we don't know. And that's what drew me in, <laughs> right? That, that was actually the stuff that hooked me. And I'm like, oh, maybe I can use mathematics to study biology. What? <laughs> right. And that's, that's partly why I'm here today <laughs> is all because I became a Christian. And it's kind of funny how Maybe 20 years ago, when I was really starting on this this path, uh, the National Institutes of Health um, in America, they were pouring out money to lure people like me or physicists or computer scientists into doing biology because they were like, we need help. We need your quantitative people to help us. And I'd go to meetings and there's all this money slushing around, you know, we have grants for this and grants for that. And Sometimes physicists would ask, you know, I remember there's a Russian fellow, a Russian physicist, he asked me, so how did you get into this? You know, how did you get interested in biology? And I was like, oh, I became a Christian. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> and I was like, well, it's the whole creation evolution thing. I became a Christian. My pastor confronted me. What do you think about evolution? I don't know. I don't think about evolution. I'm interested in maths. You know? And so that, so that what led me to the thing, and I'll just never forget this Russian fellow just looks at me, this is not typical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you, you, never, you never know <laughs> right, where, where it might take you or where it might lead you, but sometimes you just have to look and see what's going on in this mess and, and see what draws you in. <laughs> Sean, can you think of anything else? When you were looking over the questions that I sent you oh, yeah. and you were pondering them through is there anything we haven't brought up today that you thought oh I'd like to talk about that yeah just just quickly I think we touched a lot of this but there's this one little bit um you know, just like how I was talking about like apologetics and you know and and certainly you know being I was at university when I became a Christian when I got saved and then I was started dealing with all these issues. And evolution was one of the few things that that challenged my faith. And it was when I armed myself with information and I learned about things, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This is there's more more going on here than just on the surface. And I would say it's it's the same thing with um, like mathematics. Not to say that I was ever challenged on my faith because of mathematics, but actually it reinforced it. <laughs> You know, because one of the things that I've noticed, um, you know, over the years as a researcher, particularly doing theoretical mathematical modeling and stuff, is a lot of scientists just presume mathematics works just because <laughs> it just does. You know, it's kind of like, like if you ask, well, why does it work? Why does mathematics work? It's kind of like asking, well, why is there air? <laughs> you know, why is there gravity? It's, it's kind of like asking some ridiculous fundamental question, but it, but that that little question, you know, as I pulled on that thread, I was like, oh, my gosh, there's so much in here. And that's partly why, you know, I did my little apologetics talk on mathematics and God and reality. Because when you when you pull on that, why does mathematics work? It unravels all this stuff. And it becomes clear that it works because, well, God made the universe on a mathematical architecture. But not only that, he gave our brains the ability to do mathematics. And I've just been so stunned at how, you know, around me, there's this constant presumption. It just bees that way. <laughs> you know, it just, that's just, just how it is. Why would you ask such a silly question? 
And I was just like, that's that's one of the ways that I guess my faith has been reinforced, you know, and and, and as I'm navigating, you know, the very secular, atheistic sort of society around me, it's just, you know, being aware, you know, God's thumbprints are all over creation. And, you know, and, and I'm certainly not the only one, you know, there's been f- big shot physicists, uh, there's been uh, big shot biologists and so forth that is, as they dig deeper into into science into what's happening in reality it's it's funny how how some will just say you can see <laughs> thumbprints of the creator and of course you know if if you're a theist you know that's that comes easily and if you're an atheist you might recoil against it you know and and today you know it's it's not often discussed how the the big bang theory was rejected first because of its implications you know it implied a well, whole beginning <laughs> you know, and where did it come from? It implies someone started the whole process, right? We don't really think about that too much, but there's, you know, as you dig into reality, you know, from my perspective and many other uh, certainly smarter perspectives, um, you see God's fingerprints all over everything. That sounds like a pretty good way to finish it off, Sean. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for your time because that's going to be so helpful to families with students who are mathematically minded and science minded. Mm. Give them a good well, it's just so encouraging to hear how it's been for you and the possibilities. So mm. so thanks again.